A cowboy goes to the doctor. He says, man, I just heard all over. The doctor says, well, have you had any accidents lately? No, nah, I was bucked by a bronc. I was kicked by a mule. I got bit by a snake. The doctor said to you, you wouldn't call those accidents? No, nah, every one of them varmints did it on purpose. Point is, when you hear somebody say the words, you did that on purpose. Isn't it true that we almost always assume an evil intent? If someone says, you did that on purpose, they are almost always implying that, that you had a bad motive for whatever it is that you did. So what does it mean then when we say that about God? Because in the 8th chapter of Romans, we know that we have no condemnation status in Christ, and we know that we have a no separation status from the love of God. But in between, Paul says, we live in a world in bondage to decay, and there is a lot of frustration, and we groan. So how do we reconcile the groaning of the world and a God who is sovereign and is in control? So well-meaning people like you and me, we often step in to defend God when something bad happens with some, at times, very terrible theology. A couple loses their baby. And somebody says, well, God just wanted another little angel in heaven. Really. God is so lonely that he took their baby on purpose. A drunk driver hits a van and a mother is killed. And someone says, well, we just have to trust that God has a better plan. So God runs the universe by taking mothers away from their families? The way that we sometimes defend God makes it like God is actually the author of evil. After we finish this series in a few weeks, we're going to start a sermon series that I really want to encourage you to come to. We're going to examine popular things that people say that sound biblical or, but are really not from the Bible at all. The sermon series is called, That's Not in the Bible. And you need to be here for that. But listen, I do not believe that God sends evil on purpose. I do believe that God can bend evil to fit his purpose. That is what Paul says in the 8th chapter of Romans. I got a couple of, of messages from the last time that I preached out of this series. It apparently resonated with some of you that you are, you are not alone when you are facing God and you have no words left to say. You have prayed everything that you know how to pray. Sometimes life puts us in situations. We just don't even know what to say to God. And it is a great encouragement to us to know that the Spirit is there. And He's helping to intercede for us in those moments. And taking our groans to God. So Romans chapter 8, beginning in the 28th verse, I would like you to read from your own Bible, but it says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. Those He called, He also justified. Those He justified, He also glorified. I think that that is one of the most encouraging passages in all of Scripture. It is used often, but it is often misused. That little phrase. In all 
things, God works for the good. That has to be handled very carefully. Because Paul does not say all things are good. He does not say that in the moment we can see how God is working and making something good. What he does say and what he does promise is that nothing can ever prevent God from accomplishing his good purpose for your life. Here is the problem. God's good and our good often are not the same. Because, and I want you to write this down, our focus is on the immediate more than the ultimate. Isn't it? So I'm in a bad place. And I want God to do something good. And by good, I mean I need relief from this. I want a better circumstance than what I'm in. But God thinks of good more in terms of character than comfort. Because he has predestined that I should be conformed to the likeness, to the image of his son. So anything that is helping me look more like Jesus is good. And anything that is taking me away from Jesus is bad. So sometimes the things that I want and think are good are actually bad. Because they're taking me away from Jesus. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. This is God's purpose. And you need to hear this. God reigns on purpose. He always has. Paul writes in the first uh, chapter of the book of Ephesians, In him we were also Chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything out in conformity with the purpose of his will. So it is God's will that you and I grow in Christ's likeness, that we reflect the majesty of Christ, who is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, because the more that we reflect Jesus, the more that we magnify Jesus, and the more glory and honor and praise go to Jesus. So God is collecting a group of people that he has called his church, in whom he is doing this work of conforming. That is his eternal purpose. Two chapters later in the book of Ephesians, Paul continues and he says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. So God is focusing on the ultimate good, not so much your perception of the immediate good. So continuing in my groaning is more important to God than discontinuing my groaning. He doesn't make us groan on purpose, but he can use our groaning for his purpose. Our choice is whether or not we're going to groan purposefully. North Korea, civil servants that are high achieving are given a status symbol by the government, a Chinese-made refrigerator. And we take refrigerators for granted, but in their country, it is a status symbol to have a refrigerator. The problem is the electrical grid in the nation of Korea is so unsure, people do not put food in their refrigerators because it will most likely spoil. So they use their refrigerators to keep their books. And what Paul is saying is that God has the power to work in all things so that you can be used for that which you were created. You don't have to get off purpose in your life. He's sure about this. He, he does not say we 
surmise, we guess, we hope, we wish, we conject. He says, we know that in all things God is working for the good of those who love him. You see, that means, write this down, we can live on purpose. Well, what does that mean? Three things. First, you need to understand that we were, we were called on purpose. You've got to listen to the verbs in the text in Romans 8 that I read. Called, foreknew, predestined. The emphasis in the text is entirely on the initiative of the work of God. Your salvation did not start with, with you, answer, with God answering your call. It, be, it began with you answering the call of God. In fact, that was preached in the very first gospel sermon. Peter is, is with this large crowd. He preaches Jesus. He lifts up Jesus. He told the people, you are sinners. Christ has been crucified because of your sin. They're cut to the heart, it says in Acts 2. And they asked the question, what do we do? And Peter said, you need to repent and you need to be baptized right now. By the way, if you have decided that Jesus is the Son of God and you know that you are indeed a sinner, you need to repent and you need to be baptized right now. And he explains that, that when you do that, you will receive forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And look what else he says, Acts chapter 2, verse 39, right after he says that, he says, this promise is for you, it is for your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom our Lord will call. We did not purpose to call God. God purposed to call us. And this plan was conceived in his mind before you were ever conceived in a womb. Paul writes in the second letter to Timothy, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. Now, a little side note. I do not believe that Paul is dealing in our text with what is called the doctrine of election. Some will teach that God chooses some to go to heaven and God chooses some to go to hell. And if you're chosen for either one, there's nothing that you can ever do about it. One of the things the scripture makes us wrestle with is this tension between God's sovereignty and personal responsibility. The Calvinist position is that God is totally sovereign. Everything is planned out. You have no choices. The position that the Arminians hold is that there is human responsibility. There is choice. So which one does the Bible teach? Both. It teaches both. Without apology. The New Testament authors were Calminians. We live in absolute confidence that God is on his throne, that God is sovereign, and he is in control. But when I cross the street, I look both ways. We live our lives that way. So you are Calminian. What Paul is dealing with in our text is the confidence that we can have, even when we are groaning, that our salvation from the very beginning to its very end is a work of God. We have been predestined. When you predestine something, that is to decide ahead of time where it's going to end up. And God has done that for you. He has predetermined where he is going to take everyone who loves him and who has answered his call. He has predecided that one day we are all going to look like Jesus. And he foreknew this end. 
God's foreknowledge is different than our foreknowledge. Our foreknowledge is based on studying what has already happened. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. I watch the sun come up, I watch the sun go down. I can predict. Tonight the sun will go down. Tomorrow morning the sun will come up. But God does not foreknow based on what has happened. God foreknows because He can make it happen. And He knows what He is going to make happen. And the stunning thing, I am not surprised that God foreknew me. I am not surprised that God chose me. I'm surprised that God foreknew me and He still chose me. And you ought to be surprised too. Because you were called by God's choice, for God's purpose, to God's glory. Not only that, write this down. We are changed on purpose. And here's where the pain comes into play. Because nowhere does the Bible say you are supposed to fake the ache and pretend that life is not hard. Nobody comes through life unscarred. In fact, Paul validated his ministry not by talking about his blessings, but by talking about his bruises. By talking about how much he had been wounded because he followed Jesus. And every time he was wounded, he would hold up a God at work sign. Because God does not plan pain, but God can use pain in His eternal plan to reproduce the character of Christ in us. Look at verse 29 again from the message and how it's rendered there. It says this, God knew what He was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love Him along the same lines as the life of His Son. The Son stands first in the line of humanity He restored. We see the original and intended shape of our lives there in Him. So I heard this story about a lady. She's in her mid-40s. She has a heart attack. She's in the hospital emergency room and she's talking to the Lord and she says, Lord, is this the end? The Lord answers and says, no, I'm going to give you 40 more years. And she thinks to herself, if I have 40 more years, I, I need to start changing things, taking better care of myself. So in this long stay that she has in the hospital, she decides to get a tummy tuck and some liposuction. She has a facelift and takes the lines out of her eyes. She even has a hairdresser come in and color her hair. She's released three weeks later from the hospital. She's walking across the street, gets hit by a bus and killed. She says, Lord, I thought you said I had 40 more years. God said, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> Here's what Paul is saying. God is going to use the circumstances of your life, all of them, to give you an extreme makeover to the point that people don't recognize you but they recognize Jesus in you. Because you know from reading Genesis chapter 1 that God is an expert at taking chaos and turning that into something beautiful. So over 100 years ago at a Scottish seaside village, some fishermen were in a little restaurant and they were talking about their catch of the day. And one of the fishermen, when he was talking about his catch, he put his arms out you know, to show how big it was and he inadvertently hit a teapot that a waitress was carrying uh, beside him, knocked it off of her tray, and it hit the floor, splashed up onto the wall, and it stained the wall, a brown tea stain. The owner of the restaurant came out, he's looking at the wall, and he says, I'm just going to have to paint the whole wall. And the man in the back corner, he says, maybe not. He comes over with a little black box. He opens it up, and he pulls out some brushes and some pigment and some linseed oil. He dabs a little here and he swashes a little there and, and pretty soon a brilliant stag appeared with magnificent antlers and he signed at the bottom, E.H. Landseer, Sir Edwin Landseer, Britain's greatest painter. God knows how to take stains and mistakes and heartaches and he just goes to work. 
And God creates beauty that we did not see, that we never even expected could ever come. I'll never forget reading a study from a Christian publishing company that surveyed over 8,000 Christians. The question that they asked in the survey was, what was the single most important factor in your spiritual growth? Was it, was it Bible study? Was it quiet time? Was it worship? Was it being involved in a small group? And the number one overwhelming answer to the question of what is the single most important factor to your spiritual growth? Pain. You already know that. You can look back on your life and you can remember a time where life just, just knocked the props out. All the crutches were taken away and you had to go deeper with God than you ever had to go just to survive. Because your purpose is not to see how you can make the good life. But your purpose is to see how your life can make Jesus look good. And I think it is comforting to know that the Holy Spirit is at work full time, leveraging even my pain into something good. Paul writes the latter part of verse 18 in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, and the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Do we have wounds? Absolutely. But scars are proof that the enemy took a shot, but he didn't take me out. Because God has the last word. And it is a good word. Write this down. We are completed on purpose. We can know this because it doesn't depend on us. It depends on God. Even our difficult circumstances cannot stop God from finishing what it is that he started. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. In your story, there are chapters that are full of sin, full of hurt and sorrow and death, but they are not in your last chapter. Look at verse 30 again. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Paul's talking about you in the past tense. He's talking about your future glorification as if it is a done deal. Because it is in God's mind. Because it is God's purpose for you to be glorified. And God knows it, and he predestined it, and it's going to happen because God is God, and our God reigns on purpose. And that is a day that the entire creation is longing for and is excited about. But right now, i got to admit, I, I look pretty unglorified. And for just being honest, so do you. But if we could see the finished project of what God is going to work out in us, we would be so encouraged right now. So do not let your groaning keep you from gaining a perspective on God's ultimate purpose. And don't despair as if anything can frustrate God's plan for you. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen. For he who calls you is faithful. So you can live on purpose. You don't have to be a refrigerator with books in it. But we can, in the power of God, through the leading and prompting and tutoring of the Holy Spirit, 
live the lives for which God has called us to live. It's going to take intention because life is hard. But I want to give you a couple of quick thoughts that just ground me and give me a compass for life. And here is the first one that I want you to get. And this is something that you have taught to your little kids. God is great and God is good. I am sure of that. Even when I am not sure of what's going on. Because I've been to the cross. And that's why the moment every week when we take some bread and we take the cup, that is never in me a trivial moment. It is my grounding moment. It is that moment when I remember who God is in the cross was the worst thing that has ever happened. There has never been a moment of more undiluted evil in human history than that moment of the cross yet. The cross was the best thing that has ever happened. When a gracious God gave a sinless son for you. The roof of the Sistine Chapel is an amazing sight and I hope to be able to see it before I die. It took Michelangelo four years to paint it. He finished it in the year 1512 and almost immediately it began to be viewed daily. Now for four hundred years, the only way that you could light the chapel was by candlelight. So art critics of the last century would say of Michelangelo, the composition was genius to think of the, the finger of God reaching to touch the hand of man. It was just an incredible image, but the coloration, it's just mediocre. The last part of the last century, restorationists began to remove the the smoke and the grime that had accumulated over four centuries. They began to realize that when you get past all the dirt, colors are astoundingly brilliant and the genius is revealed. And I believe someday we're going to get past all of the muck and the sin and the grime that that we live in right now. And we're going to see the brilliance and the genius of our Creator. But right now I have a cross. And the cross tells me that even though I don't know what He is doing, I will not forget who He is. Paul is in prison in the second letter he wrote to Timothy. Paul knows he is going to die. And he says in verse 12 of chapter 1, that's why I'm suffering as I am. I'm not ashamed. Because I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Please note, he did not say, I know what I have believed. Because when you are in that darkest place, having a solid theology is not going to take you very far. It's not what you know. It is who you know. Paul said, I know him. And even if I cannot understand what is going on, I know who is in charge and I know who has a purpose for my life. And when the cross shapes the purpose of your life, you can know even when you can't understand. So because my God is great, and because my God is good, I will love God on purpose. And that is a decision that I have to make every single day, just like you. It is the great commandment. And I can obey it no matter what life throws at me because I know God's purpose for me. So I am going to love God. And the chief way Jesus said that you do that is by loving others. And I can follow Jesus in a life of risky love no matter what it costs. Because I know 
No matter what it costs, it will be good. So Paul just can't take it anymore. And he bursts into one of the longest praise songs in the Bible that begins in the 31st verse of Romans 8. He says, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God is working in all things. And you know that he gave his own son for you. So will he not give you all things to survive all things?